the intervention. No, we are not talking about whether uh, you know you should. Um, um, how do I say? Um, despise uh, homosexuals based on what had happened before, or something like that. All right. So I decline to to venture deeply into this into this matter, and I think it's a dangerous territory, basically. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, catch on. <laughs> catch on. So, uh, if let's say most of us here in this book court tonight, it's agreeable to say that it is actually a right. Homosexuality is a right. Do you think that it is appropriate to protect this kind of so-called right in Malaysia, being uh, Malaysia, as you know, Malaysia, right? So, what do you think? You know I disagree to that, right? But somehow, or if you want to say that this is right, I don't think Malaysia has the legal framework to provide such a venue for us to say that homosexual is a right. So in the first instance, I look at the philosophy of the country. I always emphasize on the civilization. Let's say Malaysia is, is a, I think Malaysia is a civilized, is a kind of civilization. Every civilization has its purpose and objective. Every civilization, because a civilization will collapse without purpose and objective. What is our objective then, as a state, as a country, as a civilization? What is our purpose? As a nation, what is our ambition? I put it this way, the philosophy of the country is that asas pertama kepercayaan kepada Tuhan. That is believe in God. That everyone have fall or that hukum negara. That is philosophy of the country. And the last, it ends by kesopanan dan kesusilaan. We, can we agree that it is immoral? instead of it's a right. If you say it's a right, I cannot accept it then how we are going to protect which I do not believe in it. It's not in the philosophy of the country. The country does not put it as one of the issue, one of the something that is to be defended. To be defended in a way because it's not within the philosophy. So that is from the establishment of the very civilization of certain civilization we have that. And secondly, from the legal point of view, I look at the constitutional framework. Is there anywhere in the constitution that can sustain homosexuality as a right? I've been studying the constitution and reading it every day, almost more than I read the Quran itself. I'm sorry as a Muslim. But while I was reading the Constitution, I've been within the subject for almost 20 years. But I couldn't find, except when the people argue on the right to life, right to equality, no discrimination on the ground of gender that exists in 2001. But what I find in the framework of the Constitution is that there's no place to allow homosexuality there's no place to allow something which is immoral to be flourished or condoned or sustained in this civilization. What I have in the Constitution is two provisions we talk about restrictions to freedom or fundamental liberties on the ground of immorality. So we find provisions in Article 11 and Article 10 that certain rights cannot be exercised when it's against public morality. So what is immoral cannot be said as a right. As a result, if we claim it's a right, for instance, then we have to punish people who disagree with this homosexuality. For instance, we have, as, as the result of acknowledging homosexuality as a right, we will find a situation where this homosexuality or LGBT in general can claim for benefit rights or benefit freedom. 
They can claim for they can claim for freedom of rights. They can claim for non-discrimination. If a person or an employer does not want to hire a person who is homosexuality, and he may be guilty of an offence of discriminating, are we ready, or is the civilization is ready on that philosophy that to punish those people who disagree with homosexuality? So the mafu mukhalafa is that if we acknowledge homosexuality as a right. We have to find some way to ensure that this right is flourish and condoned. This is something which I don't find basis for this civilization, for this nation and country. I don't want to speak on the position of Islam as the religion or the federation. So Muslims also have some debate among themselves also have the debate on it. But if I want to say that. My position is very clear. The whole structure of the constitution does not provide a place for this kind of immorality to become a right. Thank you, Kashyap. Uh, I actually have one additional question to Kashyap before we pass to Mr. Lim. Since you say that you you read constitution more than you read Al Quran, right? I have one constitutional question. Is it right to say that Section 377, especially B and C, is right in place as it is actually in line with Article 3 of the Federal Constitution, as mentioned by two of the ministers in our uh, cabinet minister? What do you think? We go to technicalities, probably that is um, arguable. As a legal person, uh, somehow we will have to see what is the implication of Article 3 itself, which many have argued that people from the bar probably have argued that Article 3 does not give, does not have an application that every law must always be consistent with Islam. I want to mention here is that even though I'm not saying that I agree that Islam is not the religion of the country, it is an official religion in the sense that it's officially recognized by the constitution. What I'm trying to say is that even if we separate religion from the country, from the state, the separation of religion from the state, we cannot separate morality from individuals. No individual, even they claim as atheists, they cannot separate themselves from morality. It will remain indiv individual. It's natural for a human. In Arabic word, it's a spiritual. It's natural for a human to have ethics in themselves. It's natural. I don't want to argue whether this is Islamic state or not, because everybody understands my point, probably. If law, constitutional law students, they've been reading my article on the scope and application of Article 3. But I want to say that even if we separate the religion from the country, we cannot separate morality from individuals. Thank you. All right, thank you, Kasha. Uh, move on to the next speaker, Mr. Uh, Lim. So you and Bar Council has been consist consistently saying that Section 377, especially B and C, is an archive law, right? So what do, why do you actually have that kind of proposition and what is the uh, what is the solution to actually Section 377? Okay. Can I also take the opportunity to address some of the issues raised by uh, uh, Ms. Shamrani as well? Later, later. But um, don't raise your hands. Uh, I'm not going to ask people who have engaged in either oral sex or anal sex to raise their hands. <laughs> but I think, ask yourself the question, when, when was the last time you either gave or in, uh, part, uh, participated in such sexual activity? And I think that's the answer. Why is archaic? Right? I mean, there's no place in, in today's society. For that simple reason, 377A and B, that is, as uh, Dr. Farouk correctly pointed out, does not discriminate between uh, same-sex or different-sex uh, sexual conduct. And let me just talk, like, again, we, we, we have to be, as lawyers or law students, we have to be very specific about terminology. What is homosexuality? 
homosexuality doesn't necessarily mean uh, uh, to, to the extent of the sexual conduct itself. So the question of homosexuality, crime or right, in itself, we don't necessarily, it follows that 377 criminalizes homosexuality, it criminalizes sexual conduct. Okay, so I've broken that uh, uh, issue. Morality. Many things are sins in this world. Lying is a sin. Right? So, does that mean we punish? In law, lying. Okay? Now, there are any number of uh, cases which touch on prosecutorial discretion, the most famous of which is the English uh, House of Lords case, where the law lords say, woe be the day if our Attorney General in the United Kingdom, or sorry, England and Wales, were to prosecute everyone who's ever broken the law. Okay, now we come back to 370.